All right, so welcome, welcome, Brian, for uh, joining me on this interview. So I want to ask you, um, what was that one thing that got you on this unusual path, if you will? Well, I'd have to say there's not one thing. Uh, there's definitely a string of things that occurred going all the way back uh, to when I was a kid. I would start meditating and experimenting with consciousness and things like that. The, the, the secret with the movie was a big deal, even though I had read a lot of stuff about it, it really encapsulated a lot of ideas and, and made me kind of look around at my world that I had created and start to take responsibility for it. Uh, but it's easy when you go through these spiritual paths to forget about things and things change. And so after raising my kids and having my family, uh, just uh, there was a huge event that happened and I lost the, the girl that I loved and, and my family, they had, they had moved to another place and it, and it didn't work out and I was really in a tough spot. My business was struggling. I was drinking heavily and there was a part of me that wanted to give up, that wanted to go jump off that building or just end it because I couldn't take the, the, the pain of it. And, and I knew from my past that I needed to probably meditate and I needed to take control of, of, of my consciousness, and understand it. So I went through this path where I started meditating heavily and looking into it as much as I could. And I had a huge... Well, I want to ask you something if you don't yeah, mind. Sure. Um, Cause you mentioned that you had a near death experience. Now was yes. that near death experience after you started meditating and getting into the spiritual yeah, thing? Yeah. It's, I'll tell you all about it. It's, it starts out and I go through this maybe about six months to a year before that near death experience. And the big breakthrough I had is I, I had this, it was the tail end of a very long meditation. And I had this, it could have been a lucid, very vivid dream, but it felt real to me. It felt substantial where I had gone to this place where I could see all of my different realities. I had explored quantum jumps by uh, Cynthia Sue Larson and reality transurfing and Frederick Dotson. But I, and, and it, so it was definitely part of my focus in this meditation. But, you know, I felt like my, my, I, I definitely had a Kundalini type of awakening. I could feel the energy in my body. I was using exercises and Qigong techniques. And in this particular meditation, it felt like I met a version of myself from the future uh, that that knew everything about me and all the different possibilities. And it was very vivid and powerful. And this version of myself said, Hey, you're about to have something big happen. And there's not a lot of other timelines that exist after this. And it was like, I had been given a memory and then it was kind of fuzzy. And then it felt like a dream. And so then fast forward to this it was after the Super Bowl when the Broncos beat the Carolina Panthers. I'm a big Bronco fan. So it's one of those, when your team wins the Super Bowl, you stay up all night on the couch watching all the highlights. So I naturally did that. I'm watching, hey, I'm sitting on the couch and some people came to rob my home. It was a home invasion. And they probably looked in, I, I, my house was sitting in a, next to a park. So there was a big fence. They could just jump over the back fence by the park. And in the backyard was a pool and there was uh, two porch doors. One would go into a bedroom and one would go into the kitchen. And they probably looked in at my bedroom and saw that it would, nobody was there. And they probably thought that nobody was in the house. But I woke up and I heard a bump. And, you know, I just had been laying on the couch. This is like three or four in the morning. And I walk up to the door and I see that my porch door is, is open. And of course my first thought is, Oh my, my cats are going to get out and I'm going to lose my cats. And I'm not thinking, why is my, and I thought I'd left it on this whole time. I've been so bewildered that I left my, so I'm looking down the whole time looking for my cat. And then I come up to the door and it was one of these old porch doors and my friend had owned the house and I didn't it kind of ground when you shut it. So it was really hard. So I think that's what I heard. And for some reason, I had never fixed the door. So that, that's another variable in this whole thing. And I look up and there's this kid with a, with a gun pointed at me. Wow. And so my first, imp it felt in that moment, because it's a short period of time, you have a second to make a decision. 
like I had already experienced this before. And even when this is happening, I'm remembering what had happened when he said something big's about to happen. And then the whole event happens to me like a memory, as if I'm experienced. And I could see, like I was in the form of a like wave, like I could see all the probabilities in that moment. I was detached. I was felt safe. I was okay. I slam the porch door and I turn around and I start running. And he pulls the trigger and shoots at me. This is a, you know, it's double pane glass. So I hear that in slow motion, I hear the bullet go and then, and then it bounces off my back. It, he was shooting with the 22. It wasn't like in the movies where it's like you hear a big boom, you know. But I feel this thing bounce on my back and I run to the other room and there's another person in my bedroom across the way and he starts uh -huh. to shoot at me. Then multiple bullets are, I'm seeing them with my eyes and going above me in the, in the wall. It's like I was in the matrix. And I'm still, bizarrely, the whole time, feeling like everything's going to be okay. I could see versions of myself, it, like faint whispers. And, and so I'm able to escape outside. Obviously, they had gotten scared and had ran away. P police eventually used dogs and found them right away. But I go back inside after I call the police. And um, they're like, you know, looks like you've been shot. And I'm like, oh, no, I haven't been shot. And so... <laughs> So uh, they take me to the hospital and they say, yeah, the bullet bounced off your back. Wow. And I'm in this moment and I'm just, you know, they, they're just in my boxers and I have to, they give you those paper gowns and I go out with my Uber in my paper gown, <laughs> go back to the house and there's the whole street is cordoned off and helicopters are floating and it's the house across the street from me. Wow. Where these kids had lived, they were just some kids, they're the dad had not been around and this was a regular thing that they did is they did these home invasions, but they wouldn't let me into my house. So I'm just watching them and this kid, these kids are threatening to kill themselves and all kind of crazy things and the, and the speakers and everybody in the neighborhood surrounding watching what's going on. And I'm standing there in my boxers in the paper gown with paper, with those little paper slippers they give you at the hospital. Yep. <laughs> and, and I'm just, the whole thing, and in that moment, I had this moment where everything quieted down and was like, I'm still in this dream memory. So after everything, and I finally get back to my house and I, and I start to really think about this, I go on this long journey to prove that I wasn't insane. Well, the first thing that starts happening after this event is- you Start wondering if you're going insane, yeah. Well, the, uh, beyond just what had happened with the bullet hitting my back, I started to see crazy changes around me that didn't make sense. That's when I was concerned that I, my dad had suffered from dementia. So I was concerned something was going on. I, I saw objects in my house that had never been there before. I was, I, I, I like to run. So I, I remember a place right next to my house. I would run through the lot it was an empty lot. And it was a restaurant that had been fully there and it didn't look like it was just built. It had dust on it. So like the next day I see this restaurant, I start talking to my kids and they're talking to me a little bit differently. Like they're into different music and they're using different terms. I have friends call me that uh, these are people I knew in high school that I never really talked to, but they act like I've been friends for a long time. I have uh, notes on my desk that I know I didn't write and emails and accounts that I, so I'm, I'm insane. Doctor, please tell me I'm, I'm insane. Is something wrong with me do a scan. Everything's okay. Something's wrong with me. And so I started to suspect that I had, ex I had, because of the extremeness of this, maybe I had gone into a parallel reality or jumped or that my reality had shifted. And I went on this huge journey to try to find out what had happened, trying de sensory deprivation tanks and every machine possible. You to, were on a quest for the answers. Quest. It's like, what the answer. heck? Yes. Yes. A, lot of, a lot of my podcast is just documenting and reality transurfing is one thing that helped me to understand and some other so books. So how did that fall into your lap? Well, I, I like to ask other transurfers, how did it come into your experience? For me, it's a little different than others because I didn't suddenly come on to reality transurfing after all this had happened. I'm an information junkie and I'll read everything. And it's, it was just like uh, right when that book came out, it was in the Amazon. Oh, if you like this one, you'll then you'll like also this. like this one. So I remember reading that book 
And it kind of just mixed itself into the whole flood of all the other books that I had written. And it was very similar to Frederick Dotson's Parallel Universes of Self, which is a wonderful book. It's talking about the same exact things. And, but I, it was impressive because it was long, but it was just in one of those. And I remember, uh, then I remember coming to it again because it kept on being mentioned and then reading it. And the second time that I read it, the first time it kind of just, maybe there was a part of me that blocked it that didn't want to like really delve into some of the details of it. And then the second time, I don't remember reading any of this second time I'm reading it. And it seems like, yeah, this is a different book than what I read yep. before. And yep. then third time, different book than the, than before. It, it's almost got like this, biblical nature to it like a famous text that some parts of it are timeless and it feels like they were written a long time ago and it feels like uh in many ways once you start to really research it and delve in to focus on it uh it's like i already knew it all along mm -hmm. i know I trans surfing came into my experience because i'm, I'm an interpreter so i love right translated information and so like you amazon said if you like this translated stuff you and it was russian stuff right. you might like this and i'm like what is this reality and like you it kept coming into my experience and i try and pay attention to those things if something comes into my experience right. three times i need to pay attention because yeah. you know it's my higher being going hey pay attention <laughs> to that yeah right good so, point yeah. exactly and so it for after reading your bio here you know you talk about um not only reality transurfing, but you go into stuff like quantum physics, re, um, quantum mm -hmm. jumping, meditation, hypnosis, qigong, sensory depri uh, deprivation, virtual reality, mind tech, ayahuasca, psychedelics, channeling, manifestation, yeah. mindfulness, neurolinguistic programming, epigenetics, EFT, energy, psychology, yoga, luck coaching, and much more. Sounds like you became a course junkie. I can totally oh, relate to that. No doubt about it. I, I was into, first of all, I was into neurolinguistic programming in college. I wrote my master's thesis on Richard Bandler. And that was my fascination. And one of the aspects of neurolinguistic programming is modeling. If you really want to find success in a particular field, for instance, if you want to find an archer, you want to, you want to hit the bullseye every time. Well, you go to the best archer and you go beyond just them shooting the arrow. You, you model everything about them. How do they breathe? What do they eat? Well, how do they talk? And so I kind of took this upon myself once I really got into NLP, which is still a bizarre science and i could talk about that forever is i wanted to model as many successful people that had had awakenings and understandings so using that i, I you know i'm i'm definitely an information junkie i'm a speed reader and and i and i take this information on myself i'm one of those that after i read it i i want to go out and, and experiment with it and apply it i want to ask you a question about nlp if you don't mind yeah any any question i'm ready what is one thing that is important about nlp that helped you there's a bunch of things but the, the the best thing is understanding how people filter information um, one of the most basic explanations of nlp is when they first uh understanding that some people understand things feeling wise and some people understand it like visually and some people understand things auditorily and you meet people that have primary uh forms of understanding you meet somebody and they say that sounds great and the way that they kind of their 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 yeah. behavior and their attitude you can tell that they think of things auditorily first but you I, they, I want to talk about you because sure. this, this podcast is about you yeah, i know no that's so when you started learning nlp how uh -huh. did it help you what was the one thing that really helped you move forward on your journey because like you said and, and right. for me as well when you're told something or you have this near-death experience you start questioning everything and so you right. start looking for everything so there right. must have been something about that 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 was was helpful for you okay. what was that it deserves a little explanation awesome. so i was uh when you look at the history of nlp it's very fascinating because they there was this uh, famous hypnotherapist named Milton Erickson and he's one of the most fascinating guys somebody somebody's going to do a movie about him someday I hope so yes I love Erickson he oh, yeah. was at some point paralyzed 
mm-hmm. and incapable of even moving his hands. And so his only power was observation and in talking. And so people would magically go into his sessions and they would come out transformed and changed. And so a lot of NLP came from Richard Bandler and the, the, the other people involved in the project where they would come and just observe Milton Erickson and then break it down word for word and then start applying these things. And so some of the techniques that Milton Erickson used, I'm pretty, just from my, my experience and different things, I, 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 for me to change change me because I, there's a part of me that's always thinking and analyzing and everything. I, I needed to find a way to induce trance in myself and understand subjectively how to change my own behavior. And I was able to do that by applying the different models they created when they looked at Milton Erickson, this, the language patterns that I, I'd, I'd start to create certain meditations for myself. And then I, then I went and t- took some NLP programs and, and I was able to apply this for others. But the biggest rediscovery for me was learning how to go into that part of you that they're subconscious and there's a part of our subconscious that's like a vault. Everybody has to deal with it. We have subconscious reactions and behaviors and things that come up all the time. And it's very frustrating because we, we, we know what we should be doing, but we end up doing something different. And NLP was the first time, at least using that model of NLP, because NLP is a study of reality in in many ways too. Yes. But uh, that by using that, I was able to change my, my, experience of things my reflection of things and really change my subconscious mind what was it that um that you felt you needed to change something within you well there, there's just a way that we kind of learn how to process information and when i started so you learning, were looking for a way to process what happened to you i was learning about a, a way of to process information but we learn bad habits when we yes. when we're taught and uh, we have certain forms and modes of thinking. And so when I, the one thing is like yes. submodalities. <laughs> yeah. uh, when you learn about submodalities in neuro-linguistic programming, and that's adjusting little things like the brightness of an image or to if something really bothers you by making it black and white and shrinking it and learning kind of the levers of your, it's kind of more of an advanced visualization. Uh, w- one of the interesting aspects of NLP is linking eye movements to the way that your brain works mm-hmm. so you can you know if you look if the and people use this when they try to see if you're lying uh and in the fbi they use some of the nlp models to look at your eye movements if you um depending on your if you're re- left or right handed when you look up you're generally looking at a visual memory or looking at a visual creation that you're creating if you look up into the left or to the right if you look over you're you're looking at your auditory memory or you're creating an auditory memory and then if you look down you're accessing feelings you can even access taste you can see by it's almost like our eyes are like a joystick and you can uh, see how somebody kind of is taking in the information by the way that they move their eyes so i started proactively applying this in my meditation so if i i want to bring up a mem- memory i might look up into the right or, or if I might um, want to bring up sounds or feelings and I would start enhancing my visualizations and I started to change my memories and I started to enhance my future, all kinds of little techniques and tools and things that enhanced my ability to do a lot of the things that I was trying to do at the time, if that's the best explanation. It's a little complicated, but that's for me personally, that's the things that really changed me. The model. Oh, yeah the modeling, the, uh, the, the submodalities and understanding eye movements and all that stuff. There's a lot more to it, but th- th- those are the things that really helped me. So you do um, talk a little bit about in your bio um, that you just mentioned ayahuasca and psychedelics. Um, is that something you like to talk about or is that something that you yourself have used on your journey? I can talk about it. It's kind of weird. I have two kids. So it's always, are my kids going to watch this? Because I don't know if I want to talk about my LSD and ayahuasca experiences. Well, I guess kids don't do it 
okay, it's one of those things that you want to wait until you're older. Uh, and I have had this is an adult channel, so no kids will be listening. <laughs> so it's it, I was you know I, I haven't really dedicated an episode of the Reality Revolution. I was interviewed on another, and I've I've tried ayahuasca once. I have had many LSD experiences. I do believe that certain psychedelics can be a window into the soul and can be a method of awakening, definitely not to depend on. It's temporary, but it, it gives you this vision that you realize it's there. It's beyond just your mind, you realize it's there. And a lot of people, if you trace back their awakenings, they, uh, in many cases, it, it, some kind of psychedelic is what pushed them forward to explore more. I would say that there are people I meet that become dependent on these modes and they end up not having the spiritual fulfillment they, they truly want because of the dependence. You can reach these states and um, levels of understanding and awakening outside of psychedelics. That being said, the research is fascinating. The stuff that I've experienced is beyond incredible. Yeah. My brain is very creative. If, it is, if, if some of this stuff isn't real, um, it's beyond incredible. I believe that I've seen the beginning and end of the of the universe and God and the devil and angels and all kinds of crazy things. I've met the, the elves that they always talk about and I've seen these things. Uh, and it was very transformative. It's a transformative experience. When your ego dies and it's so profound, the feeling, the visuals, there's it's very powerful. And so I haven't really dedicated an episode to that. I do, when I talk about the reality revolution, I do think that we are starting to understand that psychedelics are not just a party drug, that they are profound ways to explore your spirituality when done in safe settings, especially with people that are experienced in those particular modes. <laughs> Agreed, especially, you know, ayahuasca, it's, it's an indigenous sacred medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, I personally, I would love to talk to you about it because I've personally, yeah. I worked with a shaman. Um, oh. I, I experienced trauma from like ages 14 to 16, uh, yeah, yeah. ages four to 16. Um, so I, over the years, I uh, worked with this shaman and uh, we did a uh, sacred ceremony and it was the unveiling of mm -hmm. who I really am behind the experience of the yeah. trauma. And it made looking at the trauma a completely different perspective. So yeah. again, with you, you know, I, there's a, there's a place for it, but it's not for everyone. I would no. definitely say ayahuasca and or LSD is not for everyone. If your intention is to heal, it's definitely a sacred mm -hmm. medicine when done right with supervision, with the right people and the right circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's very healing. So, um, I'm definitely proponent of that. If that's because I had such a thick ego. Oh my God. I would love to hear, <laughs> hear more about your story. <laughs> yeah, we can talk see? later. What did you see? Uh, in some of my visions, um, yeah. in my seventh ceremony, I had a death experience. So um, oh, I've had wow. 22 ceremonies, but I'm done with ayahuasca because mm -hmm. each ceremony I went deeper. And, and this was over a period of like 10 years. All right. So it's probably good. It's a good 22 uh, sessions over. That's up to a year. Yeah, That's absolutely. Right. Because yeah. you can't rush this. You can't no. rush this. And, and I was dedicated to healing this because I could see karma you know, mm -hmm. repeating and I can see these, these patterns coming and it was, I, uh, you know, you invite her in to work with you to heal mm -hmm. trauma. And I, uh, I'm, I'm a, you know, proponent for using the sacred medicine for trauma and getting through it because you can't make it go away. Mm -hmm. But Aya shows you how to integrate it. So that's my experience with that. And I would love to talk more, but this yeah, interview you, is about you. Mazai. There's a, I was on a podcast and his, he's dedicates the whole thing to that. To Wonderful. And, and I'll have to introduce you to him because I'm sure he would love to talk to you about it. Uh, and then I could sit and talk for hours about it. So you, did you, do you think you met Aya? Personal? First time. Yeah. First okay. time I, I participated in many mm -hmm. years ago. <laughs> um, first time I participated, um, it was the snake Kundalini coming up and mm -hmm. I wasn't pr really prepared. I mean, I knew yeah. and I wasn't, it was very last minute. And I saw the Kunda, the Kunda snake, the snake. I was yeah. there, it was there. And I had some of the most brilliant visions. And yeah. she basically told me that I had the biggest ego. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so, I kind of realized that too, that man, my ego's way too big. Yeah. And yeah, so we've been thing. working on that. And you know, my ego was a facade or, you know, whenever yeah. she comes back out, you know, she's a facade to hide mm -hmm. the real traumatized, you know, and the right. real reactive and the little girl that's hiding, you know, yeah. and waiting for something bad to happen, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So she kind of like huh, exposed that. No, this is, we got to show you, this is, you got to be your authentic you. There's no more hiding behind anything. So anyway, um, back to you, Brian. Yeah. So yeah. I know that uh, you, you mentioned that you had kids. How old are your kids? 13 and 16. Awesome. Mine are 25 and 31. Oh, wow. Yeah. Two boys, two boys. And I've done ceremonies. So, yeah. I've done ceremonies with them. Oh, wow. No, that I don't, I don't think I'm going to do that, but um, it was weird first yeah, time, when, when, but then you see you're a this, mother figure to them. So there's an archetype with you. You become an archetype in the ceremony at the same time kind of am i right because you're well, it definitely changed our relationship yeah definitely yeah. well they were adults you know it's, right, right. it's like well yeah, they're like where are you going this weekend mom well um <laughs> 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 and so yeah i mean when you when you journey on this with loved ones it's 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 a deepening very right. deep healing experience so anyway back to you um you have a podcast called The Reality Revolution, and you talked a little bit about this. Can yeah. you tell us what this podcast is about? Well, it says it in the title. It's, it's about the reality revolution. What uh, is this revolution? Tell well, us about I think this revolution. If you watch you know, YouTube, on Facebook, if you just go into different boards, there's definitely something going on right now. If you look at what's happening in the world, in many ways, we see in, in your own personal experience, have you noticed that your thoughts manifest much faster than five years ago or 10 years ago? We're in, I believe we're in this period where our reality is being manifest faster and faster, placebo effect. Well, they can't do research on, on, on medicines anymore because the placebo effect is so strong as opposed in the past, they can't even do this. And Everybody in my friend is saying that they're going through an awakening and starting to become aware of these. At the same time, people that don't even know about this, their fears are being realized. We see on the news crazy stuff happening as if our own fears are being manifest just as quickly. Yeah, and I don't even watch the first 15 minutes of the news. I live in Chicago. Not. I don't even watch the news anymore. And I'm a, <laughs> I, have one, I have a degree in political science. Right. You know? So I... I, I it, the last election was tough for me because I definitely, you know, it was a learning experience. Uh, but, but I definitely believe that we are going through a period. And um, Laszlo talks in his book, uh, the quantum brain, the, sh the global shift in uh, the quantum shift in the global brain. He makes a comment that we're going through a reality revolution. That's the first time that I saw that. And I, and I love that idea. If we're in a reality revolution, somebody out there needs to, to acknowledge it and say, okay, let's make, it, let's make this positive. Let's change and get away from our fears and embrace love. And so that the, the primary intention of, uh, is, is through meditations and knowledge and interviews, people that are awakening to come into touch with this new reality revolution that's happening. And that's basically the part. It's, we cover, and I, 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 my joy is to do meditations and, and to learn about this stuff. And so that's basically what it's about. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I know for me, um, the reality of Facebook and I would be like, no Facebook, no Facebook, you know, yeah. really resistant to it until it's like, you know what, I can do some good. And so yeah. I discovered how to change up my feed to only see what I wanted to see and not yeah. have Facebook show me things. And then I began to create my own community and so mm -hmm. um we've got people from all over the world and i think it's really really good what we're doing kind of planting these seeds mm -hmm. absolutely so that you know somebody might not get it now but I i've gotten an email from somebody she'll be like you don't probably don't remember me but 10 years ago blah 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 ever since then you've changed my life so you just never know yeah how we're going to change these seeds and so um this podcast is is for that right to absolutely bring, we're bring like over. johnny apple seed johnny reality seed going around just planting these seeds maybe someday somebody will see this interview and when we just just acknowledge the fact that hey we're creating our reality and 
the media and music everywhere around you is trying to scare you. So give me an example, because I have people tell me, that's just bullshit. You don't create your reality. What does it mean when you say you are creating your own reality? What does that mean? It means many things. First of all, your thoughts end up being reflected as your reality around you. Look around, whoever's listening to this, look around the room that you're in now, and you're in vibrational alignment with everything there. You may not agree it, but it, you have agreed on some level to have all of this stuff that you see in your space. You created that reality. That wasn't some magical thing. You went and got those objects and put them in there. You may not have the, but you're in vibrational reality. When you start walking around your house, looking at the job that you have, looking at your, the people that you're hanging out with, all of that on some level, you consciously, vibrationally agreed with. If you go back and look at your whole life, if you were to analyze your thought patterns, period, the thought patterns prior to that, you would see that your life is just a reflection of your thoughts and actions in that previous period of time. I challenge anybody that's listening or watching this to look around at your current situation and say that it's not your fault. I promise you on some level, we can figure out that it is your thoughts that created and put you in this reality. Uh, and and that's a big, that's really tough for a lot of people. Yeah, I think the concept take, of cause and effect. Yeah. You know, they see their external world and they point, well, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. But mm -hmm. it's the end result. The beginning exactly. comes from here. And exactly. you are the beginning result, what comes from here out. Exactly. And we only look at what's already been projected. Mm -hmm. And what's already been projected are thoughts that we've had in the past. In the past, yes. not right now, right. So we change our thought right now, we start to change this future. Mm -hmm. So that's, I love that, you know, when, yeah. when, when then you can say, okay, well, you know, I do kind of blame and I depend, you know, I, I was working with somebody and every, every day her mood depended on what the weather was. Right. If it was sunny, she was in a good mood. If it was cloudy and rainy, now we live in Chicago, you know, it's like, Weather sucks here, except maybe five days a year we get a nice right. day. So you can imagine almost every single time it's like, oh, the weather's bad and it's making me a bad mood. And I'm like, can you decide to be happy on a rainy day? Mm -hmm. And it kind of threw her for a loop. Like, can I? And it took a while yeah. to kind of get down and get into it, that neuro-linguistic programming yeah. kind of thing where you kind of shock them out of their, their mm -hmm. habits kind of thing. Right, right. So that's wonderful. You also said um, the mission of the Reality Revolution podcast is to explore the new movement of hack reality exploring, experimental quantum physics. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sorry well, to totally go off left field. No, there. no, that's fine. It's, it's along the lines of what we're talking about. But we, as I am not a quantum physicist, I just had an interview with Cynthia Sue Larson. I would recommend uh, reading her books. It's a great place to start when you talk about the inter interaction of quantum physics and consciousness. But as we are beginning to understand the, tr the quantum model, when you look at the double slit experiment and the way that particles are both wave and particle, that, that something can be both wave and particle at the same time, and that the observer effect is involved and that we collapse particles in, we collapse waves into particles all the time, way more than we think. And we're as starting to we say that will never happen. <laughs> and then there it is. It happens. There it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then you look at um, the, the concepts behind quantum physics and the, the assertion that there's a possibility that there are parallel realities, there's quantum entanglement, that objects can become entangled, there's superposition of states, and we're starting to see that we can, that we are, the way we're maneuvering into our future is a, a choice between different collective alternate parallel realities. And it comes, I believe that reality transurfing, Body M. Zeeland is a quantum physicist. And so a lot of that stuff is based on a quantum model of the universe. But we're also, when we say we have, we, hey, we remember somebody, we have a feeling that somebody's hurt, and then it turns out they're hurt, we're entangled with people around us. And there's also superposition of states when, when they look at uh, quantum particles, they can be in two places at once. 
human beings can be super in a super position of state. Cynthia Sue Larson was just saying the other day that she had uh, remembered daydreaming in bed about going downstairs and opening the drapes to her kid's room. And uh, then she heard the kid say, mom, what are you doing? And she was clearly never left the room, but they had seen her go down and lift the drapes. And there are stories like that are happening. All There's what I think is happening right now. When you go back to the Copernican revolution, when we first realized, oh my gosh, the whole universe doesn't revolve around the earth. It revolves around the sun. And can you imagine back then the shift in thinking? I mean, it, it maybe doesn't affect that much, but what you thought was going on is not. And so I think we're going to start to come into a, a, an age, a, re, a, a new reality where we start to realize that we create reality and all of these quantum, um, uh, these understandings coming from quantum physics can be used to affect how we maneuver through our future and make decisions and all kinds of things. It's yes, totally fascinating. It ha- if it happens in the universe, it happens in our universe. Exactly. Because we are no different. Mm-hmm. So exactly. if, we, if like physics, you know, there's some, there's unseen forces that you have to account for exactly. when you're making something. Well, when we make choices mm-hmm. against physics or with physics, we're either going with the flow or with resistance. So it, resistance, internal energetic resistance is physics. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we don't Absolutely. see it like that. We think we're separate from nature mm-hmm. or we're separate from God or what have you. Right. All of these uh, things happen over there, but they don't happen here. So mm-hmm. it's, it's this newer, uh, deeper connection that we're having. You use the word hack reality exploring. What do you mean by hack reality exploring? Well, it's just like hacking a computer program, getting in and changing the program. Um, Maybe that's a word that's overused a lot, but I like it because it's quick and it's easy to understand. So if you don't like the program that's running within your subconscious, hack it. Hack hack your reality, right. And um, And that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. And I think the reality transfer thing is a hack on reality. It's hacking the way... Yeah, 100%. And it's a model. Yeah, it's a framework and a model, definitely, mm-hmm. because you can learn it intellectually. And I'm finding a lot of people are under, uh, they get reality transurfing intellectually. They know it here, right. but they haven't hacked it into their programming yet. Exactly. So it hasn't come down from the mind, the unity of mind and heart. And if transurfers don't understand the first chapter of the book, mm-hmm the Russell of the morning stars, stars. the rest of the book there, it's just going to be knowledge. That's And I found that too. What I've tried to do when I, and uh, as I go in and uh, I've tried to go into each chapter lately and then I'll go over and read some of the excerpts and then talk about it, but then I'll have a meditation afterwards. And the whole concept is take what we learned and lock it into our everyday behavior in our program. That's what I'm finding with transurfing. Like you said, it's easy to know all this stuff uh, to be aware of importance or to be aware of coordinating intent and all these things. And sometimes it's just all thought bubbles. So what I'm trying to do with those meditation is program. Okay. So like the, one of the cool concepts is the wave of fortune. Like your friend had mentioned, if she, when she sees the sun and sunset, sunrise and she's happy in the morning, isn't it interesting that those days, a bunch of other cool things end up happening? And it's like when you make that judgment that something's great, you radiate this positive energy out. And then all of a sudden that energy says, oh, well, there's these cool things that are going to start happening in that general frequency of your energy. So it's such a simple idea. I'm going to start look for something in the morning that I'm going to get super excited about. Because we've all had that moment when we stub our toe and we wake up and then next thing you know that that we, we burn our hand on the stove and the tire goes flat and some, you know, there's a bill that comes in that we didn't pay. I mean, there's always these waves that happen that they're inter, inter- coordinated. But when I'm t- telling somebody about that, oh, that just sounds like wave of fortune, a cliche. So in many ways, I agree with you. You have to, we have to go to the next step and program this stuff into our thinking. And so I'm trying to use the NLP that I discussed with the reality transurfing and kind of merge those together. And maybe if people can take it, it'll, it'll help them because it is, you have to constantly shift and remember, Oh yeah, this is how it works. I can't think like that. And you're always going to still make mistakes. You're going to say and think the wrong things because we're so reactive for so long that we're locked into all these programs and it's not easy to suddenly wake up and change how you think. So, yeah. 
Exactly. And how I learned it, um, I, I did study quantum physics and uh, I, I'm not a quantum physicist, but right. I'm a closet geek. But um, exactly, like with, <laughs> with quantum physics and the study of the brain, there is actually a system in the brain um, called the reticular activating system. Yes. And so when I think I would love to see dragonflies today and, I, and then I just feel it. I know it and mm -hmm. it's very possible. And then I send, I call them quarks. <laughs> I mm -hmm. send my quarks out or, you know, and they go looking for dragonflies to bring exactly. them to my experience. But the thing is, is I don't hold it all day long. Okay, where's the dragonflies? Where are they? I should be seeing them by exactly. now. No, I just have a loving thought. It would be so lovely to see dragonflies. Yes. And then I go off on my business and then boom, there they are. There's this is quantum flies. physics. Yes. And I, I knew it intellectually. I knew quantum physics, but until I played with it, and then I integrate it, and then I experienced it. This is when I really made the connection of how powerful we are. Exactly. And so true. you talk about manifestation and channeling. I like to say I have these conversations with Einstein. Yeah. I used to think I was going crazy, but then I no, met you're another. No, not. No. I, yeah, I, I met Dr. Levine, and he talked about how uh, in the 1970s he would meet at this restaurant with Einstein and have soup with him. Oh, and I'm wow. like, oh my God, I'm not the only one having these conversations <laughs> with Einstein. So, um, you know, because you talk about channeling uh, mm -hmm. uh, in your uh, bio as well. Absolutely. There is just so much out there. But what would you say is on, on your spiritual journey, um, having a near death experience, what would you say was the one thing that kept you here <laughs> that's the only thing i can think of to say ah that's a good question i wasn't expecting what kept me here you know the the biggest thing that i would love to share i try i've tried to do it on a few episodes uh, after i had gone through this experience and you hear about it with a lot of people that go on a similar experience when you when you realize how short life is because i should be dead right now and the feeling that i got afterwards wow i have a second chance I was given a second chance. And so every breath, everything, even bad things are wonderful. Every single thing that I do after that point, and I would love, to, I've, I have an episode uh, speaking from your future self. Um, and, I, and I'm trying to, to, I would love to, for people not to go through a near-death experience to have this feeling because it transformed me and it changed my life. And that's, it was a great thing. I, this, I'm so glad that it happened to me. I could be a scared and afraid of who's going to come into my yard, but it gave me an, in essence, Hey, my life could end tomorrow and I need to earn my second chance and I need to embrace every moment. It became, I became way more mindful. And that's the thing. I may have had thoughts where I, I wasn't happy in my life, but deep down there's this love and satisfaction of the moment that was always there. And it really brought that out. And we all have this, this, Life is just this wonderful, incredible thing, and I can't wait to spend every second of it, and everything is precious from that point on, and, and it, I, I wish I could hypnotize people so they could feel this, because once you have that feeling... It's, it's really gratitude and grace, you know, it's, it is, it's yeah. like you can't put words to it mm -hmm. and you, you don't have to have a near-death experience to experience this. No. Um, yeah, it's it's beautiful to to have the experience, even if something traumatic, quote unquote, is what got you there. Mm -hmm. You got there. I do have a question for you. Sure. Um, I know we're kind of getting toward the end here, but you talk about uh, luck coaching. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what that is? Well, it's interesting when you go and look at luck. It can be um, statistically evaluated. Uh, so there is specific when they when they go and we you figured out a, a number of questions you can determine if somebody is not lucky or lucky lucky has variables to it and so when they started looking at lucky people they started to look at particular aspects why these people were lucky and it's interesting for instance they might leave a ten dollar bill out on the street and then the person that's very unlucky would might be walking in and, and they will never see the ten dollar bill 
And the lucky person will be walking, you know, at a coffee shop, just put it out on the sidewalk. And the lucky person will see the, t- the $10 bill every time. Or there's another study that they did where they had a newspaper and they said, you know, um, count the number of times that you see this picture. Um, and there was something on the fifth page that says, forget about what everybody says. If you acknowledge this, you get $10,000 or something like that. And all the unlucky people counted all of it and they gave the results, but the lucky people stepped back and saw that and commented on it. And so there is a process of thinking, of changing your expectations, of looking at the bigger picture um, they're, they're, that, are, that, that can be trained. And when you do these things, you enhance your luck. Luck is, you are not lucky because you're lucky. It is a mindset. And when you, and, and these things, they're not woo woo or mystical. There, uh, if you embrace some of these particular behaviors and actions that statistically lucky people do, and so, yeah, I've uh, I've done some, I've integrated into that some of my coaching is is luck training and 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 then explain because for some people they don't uh, they or they they don't want to go onto the spiritual aspect as much, but when you give them grounded everyday things that they can do to increase their luck, it changes everything, and so that's kind of what that that the luck training is. Oh, oh, very I cool. I might have done some episodes on it, but yeah. Very cool. Luck, luck training. How how to be a magnet for luck? It, I definitely it, would be one one to one by training. Now. You know, All when right. people are lucky, you look at them, and they always have common characteristics. Yeah. Most of them are outgoing. They have networks of people that they talk to. They put themselves in a situation where it's easy for luck to happen. That's the people expect luck to happen and you're not going to get lucky to staying in your house and never leaving, not communicating with anybody and seeing the world as a small, tiny thing. That's, that's the best way to explain it. Very cool. One more question. Cause I know it seems like, you know what, we can, we can go on for a long time. Hey, I'm good. I'm good. It's good. <laughs> There's definitely some things I want to talk to you about, Bring it. but um, you mentioned epigenetics. What is that and how would it help someone, you know, on this journey? Epigenetics is the science of how the body and and, and genes can change based on your environment. And so a lot of people get into their head, oh, I'm genetically inclined to, to be overweight or to have this particular sickness. And we are now finding more and more that these genes are activated by based on environment and in many cases in thoughts and so understanding the way that genes works dr joe dispenza love him yeah. in and do a terrific job and i'm fascinated by it i'm definitely not as tuned into it and i, I need to learn more uh but the biology of belief was a seminal book that i really loved and when you open up your uh, when a lot of people out there that are suffering that are sick do not realize that these are genes that, that even if they're genetic, you, you can, you can downregulate genes, you can deactivate genes that, that you have in, in your body. And it really gives you a certain level of power and understanding. It helps people out that are struggling, especially with health issues, particular to their genetics. Agreed. Yeah. You know, I work with people who, um, have body image, uh, issues to the point of, cutting or hurting themselves and so i thought about epigenetics and i love dr joseph spenza um but i discovered gua sha and it's an ancient tibetan technique and i discovered it in south korea but um the epigenetics of it is this technique actually changes the connective tissue within the body so instead of cutting i teach them how to do gua sha on their connective tissue and it actually helps them relax and it really exercises and brings blood flow to the surface of the skin and they start to feel better about themselves so this is this is a nice shift in using kind of you know we think our skin and our connective tissue is what it is you know it's my genes i have this this and this but if we can use a tool like an ancient, I mean, this this technique is over 2,000 years old, mm-hmm. uh, like gua sha, to reorganize the connective tissue through a therapy. When it comes back, it's completely different. It's reformed. Right. It's reshaped. Almost like a matrix where right. it comes the back, you know. Change. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so you activate uh, different 
uh, DNA structures within mm. your DNA and begin to change that. I'm a true believer of ep epigenetics. Because well, it, just DNA in general, it's interesting. When they've put a DNA molecule in a, in a, in a, in a sealed area that's dark, they have found that the DNA will suck in light like a black hole. And that, that DNA leaves a, a light marker. Like when, if I was to get up from my seat and they went back and looked at this, my DNA would sit here for like 30 days. And so they're finding that light can reactivate genes. When we start understanding DNA, and um, there's, a, there's a thought that, that we might have sprung, sprung up genetically because uh, just, just light interacting with certain DNA, activating certain genes in the biology. It's just interesting. They found that new corn uh, breeds can come up out of nowhere and new animals, they've, they've studied what, why are there these animals that we've said they're extinct? They're popping up out of nowhere, and it's the it's the sudden genetic change that can kind of through the science of epigenetics and DNA. It just fascinates me. I could talk about that forever as well. And something they recently discovered: um, we get material coming in from outer space, mm -hmm. and um, I, I'm his name is escaping me, but he sent up something to the outer atmosphere of the Earth before it actually comes down and starts to like decompose and burn right. up. But he got some of those, and there's actually star seeds. There's DNA within the. Um, oh wow! Within the, um, I want to call them rocks, but it's in this substance. Uh, right. So they think they're we're still getting these star seeds coming in, and right. after a while, they connect with the Earth and mm -hmm. start to form. So we just don't know. We really just you don't know. know. It, it would be amazing if we could sit back with a pair of goggles and see energies around us and the way that we're vibrating and see what everything really looks like because we, we're kind of in this limited view for our, mo our brain kind of creates this reality but to see all these energies and different things it, some people are able to do it naturally but it's pretty it, it would be totally fascinating and fascinates me uh, me too. Well Brian um, this has been such a wonderful treat. Thank you so much. You mentioned that you have a book coming out. Can you tell us about that? Yes, the, the Reality Revolution, the mind-blowing movement to hack your reality. It talks about all the stuff we've talked about today. And I'll give a little more about my story and, and what happened. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. It should come out maybe in September or, or October. Awesome. Very cool. Keep me posted because sure. um, I can update your uh, podcast page. Okay. I'll yes, send, I'll send so, you a copy too. Very, sure. very cool. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with me. And um, I look forward well. to uh, collaborating more with you. For, for sure. Let's do it. And uh, look, I, I get to interview you tomorrow. Yay. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be fun. So this was great. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. All right.